About 30 years ago, the Griffonian Empire ruled over the whole of Griffonia, this massive landmass inhabited by mostly griffons. However, being overextended and with a bloated bureaucracy, calls for independence spread throughout the continent. We, the former crown jewel of the empire, was one of these nations. However, while our king Garibaldi III had promised continued prosperity and economic growth, this couldn't be further from the truth. Because after a costly war with the Falkor nation in our east over the post griffonian borders, our economy went into freefall, with a political deadlock in parliament unable to pass much needed reform. These issues turned our once proud education sector into crumbles and the powerful mafia would also rise from the ashes of the economy. Understandably this has turned the people towards extremism with both the communist and the national fascists gaining significant amount of popularity. While the communists are so far conforming to our democratic constitution, Bicolini has his own paramilitary group, the Black Wings, and we even have it confirmed that they are planning to march on our capital to see power. While the current prime minister is urging the king to declare martial law, the king to his disappointment decided that the risk of fights with the black wings was too dangerous and decided to instead invite Bicolini to the capital for talks. Hearing the news, the prime minister resigned, collapsing the already weak government. And since the king is refusing to work with the communists, the only person left for new prime minister is Bicolini. So a minority government was formed with only 131 out of 268 seats needed, formed by the nationalist and fascist parties. However, having reached the title of prime minister, it has at least legitimized the black wings and work has already started to gain a majority in the parliament. The small liberal party, which was part of the previous government, has voted out their last leader and replaced it with one willing to work with us. Furthermore, a lobbying effort has already started to convince more right-wing deputies that Bicolini is the only hope to crush the deadlock. Following a second party joining our government, we have reached 203 seats with 46 more deputies supporting us. This has allowed us to start passing some of our most moderate reforms that even some communists agree are good. This included a big education reform, for example introducing new textbooks. The reforms also focused on the economy where massive public works were started conscripting our unemployed to construct infrastructure in the hopes of restarting investments. One of the things we started building is the altar of the fatherland, a large complex of temples, memorials and monuments. Just as expected, this slowly reignited our economy, allowing us to continue building infrastructure and railway lines in an even greater extent. This, together with the parliament passing a law to make trains run on time, could make us the most advanced nation regarding trains in the world. Following all these reforms, our support in parliament has reached more than a majority, meaning that we can pass the Gacerbo law, a law that will change our election so that the winning party gets two-thirds of all seats automatically, meaning that once we win the next election we will have full legislative power and Bicolini can start transforming our nation to greatness. After many hours of debates with the communists and liberals trying their best to stop the law, it was eventually passed nonetheless, with the elections also scheduled a month later. After a month passed, during which we noticed a substantial growth for our industry in our south, the election took place where we got 48% of the votes, translating to 355 seats in parliament, a majority. So the more radical reforms and plans can be started. And this time no opposing politicians can stop us, only the king, but he will do nothing. Especially since it was we who finished his great project, the altar of the fatherland. However, opposition still exists, particularly in local government and from the Mafia. The locals can easily be dealt with by simply changing how they operate and allowing the parliament and the prime minister much more power. The Mafia, however, will take longer, but we will still begin to tackle them and sending our most brutal police commissioner after them. Turning to the economy, sweeping reforms are being introduced, consisting of turning our economy towards autarky in order to fix the resource deficit. 
We have also raised productivity all across the board, but focusing mostly on our military industry. A few days after this, Bicolini announced partial mobilization, both to help our economy, but also for future plans. Following the raise in productivity, our economy has finally fully recovered and is even stronger than ever. This has granted us enough popularity and legitimacy to pursue further political centralization around Bicolini. The first of the two major reforms was the creation of the Grand Council of Fascism, which will act as an extension to the parliament. The second is far more controversial, the complete ban of any opposition parties. All they are doing is stopping us from fixing the country and bringing glory to our name. So banning them will help everyone. And so with all the power secured under Bicolini, glory to Wingbardi has been restored and we will begin to work to reclaim the Carthinian Empire, the predecessor to our nation. But to reform it we will clash with several of our neighbours, meaning that we will need a much stronger army than the outdated and small we currently have. So army expansion and reform is needed. We enacted conscription for the first time since the war with Falcoria, created a military academy to train our officers, and by expanding our funding to the University of Fedora, we convinced the scientists to research better weaponry such as Taud anti-air which we equipped our divisions with once we reformed them. After this and the training of six new divisions, our army has reached over 20,000 deployed griffins, and Bicolini has decided that it's time for our first expansion, to Falcoria. As long as they exist, they will be a threat to our nation as they seek to take back Falcor. So we sent them an offer, to surrender now or surrender once they have felt the wrath of our army. They chose the hard way, so we declared war and immediately began an offensive in the center as well as in the north. We started advancing after less than a week and we soon noticed gaps in the front which we could use. So we rapidly advanced towards the capital disregarding our own defenses in favor for speed. Just as we captured the city, one of our divisions had also split their country in two, meaning that they couldn't send reinforcements to the coastal town of Sudfolk, which was completely undefended. Continuing in the north, everything started turning into chaos due to none of us having enough troops to defend the whole front. This allowed for easy encirclements that at one point led to them encircling our whole attacking army. However, this posed no problem as we simply continued capturing the rest of their cities in the north. Then, once we entered Greybill for the second time, they had had enough and surrendered. In the peace deal we annexed everything. Now, before we continue to the next nation, there are two things I have to tell you. The first is that we aren't without allies. Right after independence from the Griffonian Empire, the Carthinian Pact was formed with our three northern neighbors. However, none are fascists like us. The Duchy of Toulouse is democratic and is simply doing their own thing. Francistria is far more friendly to us, embracing our culture and holding joint army exercises with us. And lastly, Sparleus has left completely something we must deal with later. A second thing which is far more relevant to our next expansion is that we have a colony on the continent of Zibrica. And since Bicolini came into power, plans have been drawn up to expand it into the kingdom of Abyssinia. A local fascist party attracting the feline inhabitant has already been formed and military buildup is also taking place. And now that the war has ended, we have sent over a big expedition to first build up Persia, the island of the coast of Abyssinia, in order to serve as a base of operations. Then, using the guise of a vague border around our colonial city of Katren, we tried to expand into the Katkat state. However, they disputed our claims, leading to Bicolini declaring war even though we aren't completely ready. The Abyssinians immediately tried to destroy all our forces in Katren, but we had prepared for this with bunkers, stopping any advancements, especially as our forces are far better equipped and trained than theirs. During these attacks we finished our invasion plans, which consisted of naval invading three cities on the west coast of Abyssinia, then taking it from there. So before the Abyssinians had any chance to find out about our plans, we launched the invasion.
Even though supply was terrible, the Abyssinian army is defeated and we have taken control over the entire region. We can now begin to exploit and develop the area in order to make this invasion worth it. The most important resource we need is oil. It is not only needed to power our civilian industry, but since we have started investing into our air force and we are also planning to create tank divisions, we will need a lot of it. In order to do this, we will create the AGVP, which will oversee our oil industry and make sure that it serves the state over personal gain. Immediately after being founded, the organization began prospecting for oil in Abyssinia and struck the black gold in the desert of Oromiawia. We promptly started exploiting it as well as expanding the oil field. However, to reach its fullest potential, we will need to greatly improve the infrastructure of the region. But this has to wait because back home a perfect opportunity has arrived for further expansion. On the equestrian continent, a great war has begun with the changeling lands invading Equestria and seeing great success too. In this time of weakness, we will demand that the ponies return our rightful griffin land of what they call New Maryland. For far too long have they had a hoof hold on our continent. To prepare for a chance of an upcoming war with the equestrian superpower, we have not only expanded our army to half a million griffins, but by raising our conscription laws to service by requirement, we will soon reach one million. Despite all this, Equestria refused our demands and have mobilized the new Maryland army. They have even received volunteers from both the Achillean and Asterion republics in anticipation for our attack. So we didn't disappoint them and declared war immediately after the refusal. We also called in our two allies even though Toulouse was a bit reluctant. Even though they had anticipated the attack due to the war back in Equestria, they didn't have a fully manned front line allowing us to march into Hooves Plain without much resistance. After only a week of fighting, the opportunity to encircle most troops and all volunteers showed up which we immediately seized and did just that. Encircled and crushed probably more than half of New Maryland's defenses. Following this, the road to sunset was open with only a few griffins left who also were encircled. Despite some resistance in sunset itself after surrounding the city, this resistance was soon non-existent and we turned to the last city on mainland Griffonia. Here were the last few divisions which hadn't already evacuated, but just like the rest in this short war, they stood no chance. During the capturing of the town, we had together with Telusian forces crossed over to the new Manhattan Island, which had already been evacuated, allowing us to capture it without resistance. With this loss, the new Maryland government surrendered, and since we don't have plans to naval invade Equestria, we sent a peace proposal to them. Since they are quite occupied with fighting the Changelings, Princess Celestia agreed upon our demands and we could annex all the Commonwealth of New Maryland. After a hundred days, we started started our next conquest, this time against two nations at once, Sparleo to reintegrate them into the Carthinian Pact and the weak kingdom of Griffinstone, the ancient cradle of all Griffins. Just as expected, both invasions went by smoothly, with Sparleos falling first, even though they are far more militarized than Griffinstone. However, Griffinstone was still easier to defeat, it just took a longer time. After both had been defeated, we split up their land between us and our most loyal ally. Following the official annexation of Griffinstone, Bicolini also made our plans to restore the Carthinian Empire official as well. While everyone already knew this was the case, now that it's official it gives us the perfect reason to start integrating both our allies. And fortunately for them, none refused our offer. Naturally, it will take some time and effort to integrate them, especially Talus, who we will start several building projects in, since they have a harder time than Francistria to accept fascism. While we wait for the process, we will attack our last nation that we need in order to unite Carthinia, the federated parishes of Sitchameon and their ally of Asterion. They will be our strongest enemy yet, but with our growing air force it will hopefully not be a problem. We started our attack in the south of the country, away from the mountains in the north. With a big concentrated amount of forces, we could quite quickly break through and advance to our first city. 
Kiwen. Not only will the city serve as a springboard into the rest of the nation, but by capturing it they will have a massive supply issue in the north, since the river going along the city is the only supply connection to the area. So once the city was captured we immediately saw how their northern forces were running out of supply. But instead of immediately crushing them, our forces in Kiwen continued further south instead as it was largely unguarded and captured our second major city. Now we finally turn north, marching along the river with the intentions of encircling all divisions in the Arachno Ridge. Just as expected, due to the low supply the operation was a quick success with probably more than 1000 griffins and minotaurs encircled, as well as both Arachno City and Rochelion captured and fully secured. With this loss, the end of the war for Sikameon is close and even though they fought valiantly, our superior numbers and better forces couldn't be stopped. Our forces soon arrived to Midorian and the Sikameon government fled to Asterion basically capitulating. So now only Asterion is left and while invading their island would have been difficult even though our navy is quite outdated by now we have absolutely destroyed theirs allowing us to use the Cabeza de Toro passage. But before we do we cleared out the mainland part of the country, encircling the cities and destroying all forces. During this attack our forces had crossed to the island nonetheless so we simply continued further inland towards their biggest cities. With almost no divisions defending it the whole island was soon captured. However the stubborn minotaurs that they were didn't surrender and forced us to naval invade a second of their island. But after this they finally surrendered and we annexed everything. During the war Francistria had been fully integrated and as it ended we also integrated Toulouse. So we have all we need to form the Carthinian Empire. And that we did proclaiming the Carthinian Empire reformed and the process to integrate all our lands started. The only place which could be integrated straight away was the former Falkorian territory. The rest will sadly take longer as compliance must reach 40%. But we won't simply idly wait and stop our conquest, because even though the Carthinian Empire is formed, all our neighbors are harmonic and with Equestria having won the great war. If we don't do anything now they will grow stronger and unite in a massive anti-fascist alliance. So crushing them now to safeguard our future is necessary. Fortunately some harmonic infighting allowed us to prepare for longer, so that we finally have the time to deploy our long developed tank divisions. After a few months and after the infighting was over we were ready to attack our two harmonic alliances neighbors. Our army has two and a half million griffins deployed and our air force has over 10,000 aircrafts. So hopefully this massive war will go our way.
This has to be enough to deter any harmonious nations, including Equestria, to plot for the destruction of our empire. We span from Haukland all the way to Kekion, with an even bigger sphere of puppet regimes. In addition, we have by far the biggest industry in the world, bigger than the Equestrian and River Federation combined. And if they were to strike us nonetheless, our highly trained army, together with several wonder weapons being developed by our scientists, wouldn't allow them to set foot on our land. All thanks to Bicolini and his fascist ideology now spanning almost all of Griffin kind. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed my first video on the Equestrian at War mod.